Again, John 16, we're going to be starting at verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my father and ye see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore I said, I, that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you a little while, and ye shall not see me. And again, a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. The title of the message this morning is The Great Helper. The Great Helper. The Lord Jesus Christ is mighty to save a sinner. The Holy Spirit is mighty to help a saint. The word comforter has been variously translated. The terms advocate, paraclete, which means Holy Spirit, helper, have been used. In Romans 8, 26, we read that the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, which literally means take hold with me. Not take hold of me, but take hold with me. The name or the same word is used in Luke 40, 10, 40, but nowhere else in the New Testament bid her therefore that she helped me. That's the only other place it's used. And if you know Luke 10, if you know that, you'll know that Martha was complaining about her sister not helping. And I've preached on this before. I actually preached at one time down in Cerrito. I don't think the ladies liked it too well, but <laughs> I said, you know, the man's the man of God is up there preaching. I don't care who it is. He's up there preaching. And about 15 minutes before he's done, all the women take off and go to the kitchen. So they never did hear the rest of the story. As, as we know that they may have got more out of the last 15 minutes than the first part of it. The Holy Spirit has come as one who is willing and mighty to take hold with me, that I might be helped in doing the will and work of God. Can't do it without him. You may think you can, but without him, you can't. You'll just be a failure. You'll just fall flat on your face. So the first thing we want to look at is found in verse 7 is the condition of his coming. He says there, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. So it's a good thing that Christ went away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not 
come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. Now, it would have been nice if Jesus could have hung around forever and will be with him forever. But in this case, we knew why he came. He did what he came to do, and he finished his work that he came to do. And we couldn't have survived without some help. So he sends the helper. Christ had to go. Taking his humanity into the presence of God before the spirit could come, bringing the divinity into the presence of men. Notice that we say that his humanity had to go in the presence of God. His spirit's already there. It always has been, never departed. So why Christ was here in his earthly ministry in his human form, spiritually, he never left heaven. He was always there. A lot of people don't understand that today. A lot of people aren't preaching that today. It does make a difference. Acts 2.33 says, Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. So the bodily absence of Christ was to ensure the Spirit spiritual presence of the helper. Now, if you don't feel the presence of the helper, if you don't feel the presence of the Holy Spirit, then there's something wrong. You have to examine yourself. There's something terribly wrong if you can't feel that. The Spirit is what, you know, a lot of people say, let your conscience be your guide. It's not our conscience, it's the Holy Spirit that's telling us what we need to do or not do. And we hear that. We hear that, don't do that. Don't go there. Okay, we know that's what we hear. And many times we do it anyway. So the special power of the Spirit was not given until Jesus was glorified. John 7, 39, it says, But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. The Spirit came to apply the benefits of Christ's atonement. You would think that that would be enough just to have the atonement. But it was the benefits that we're still receiving today because of the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. Which, again, can't be separated. The Holy Spirit that indwells us is in constant communication. There is never a, a, a point that that link is broken. The spirit of, that dwells in us is in constant communication with God the Father, with God the Son. They're all three one. They're all three there. It's just that the spirit is now here to help us. Now picture this, and I've mentioned this before, but picture this. Okay, it's coming a time the rapture is going to take place. Christ is going to come back, take his people out, take the church out. And the Holy Spirit's going to be removed. The only thing that's keeping our world in check right now is the Spirit of God. Take him out. What do you think is going to happen? People won't have a church to go to. Because the church is gone. Now the Jews will be here. And those 144,000 that will be saved, they'll be here and there'll be other ones saved. But the church is gone. The Christian, the bride of Christ is gone. Well, 
emphasize that a little bit. The church member of the church, if he's true New Testament Baptist church, is the bride, and they are going to be taken out, along with the other saints will be taken out. Once they're gone, they're gone. The church is gone, but most important, the Spirit of God is gone. Picture what that will be like. So the coming of the helper was the proof that Christ's atoning work, atoning work was perfected. Christ said it was finished. It's finished. He said the comfort is coming. So that's finished too, because he's coming, because I'm sending him. It's not like there's going to be this great big span that, you know, they're going to be left, left comfortless maybe for a moment. But if you notice, he was still there with them at the very last. He had already crucified. He'd already risen from the dead, but he still was with them. So the spirit came to apply the benefits of Christ's atonement. So we have benefits. Second point is his mission into the world. What was his mission into the world? See, while the spirit is a helper to the believer, he is a comforter or <laughs> comforter. Can you remember right? Convictor uh, to the world there in verse eight. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So right now, it's the Holy Spirit that's convicting the world of sin. They don't want to know that. They don't want that. They don't want to hear that. And that's why many preachers today, you're not going to hear it from. They're not going to preach it. They're not going to teach it. They don't want nothing to do with it. So you're not going to hear from the pulpit hell. You're not going to hear about sin. You're not going to hear about the lake of fire. You're not going to hear anything nasty, anything bad, what we would consider being bad. You're not going to hear that because it's so, supposed to be just so happy and fluent and God loves us and, you know, he don't want anything to happen to us. This is what preachers are preaching today. In the meantime... Those folks, because the preacher fails to say anything to, are dying and going to hell. That's on them. And I wouldn't want to be one of them. I wouldn't want to have to stand before Christ and he says, why didn't you tell them about their lost condition? Why didn't you tell them that at the judgment it's the point on the man wants to die and then the judgment. Why didn't you tell them there's a judgment coming and they are going to be cast into the lake of fire? Why didn't you tell them that? Oh, well, because I wanted them to hear good things. Huh? Well, you know what's going to happen? They're going to be in a lake of fire and they're going to be there for eternity. And you didn't say nothing. In my book, that's loss of rewards. If hopefully the preacher is saved. So there are three things that are mentioned here. And these three things the world needs to be convicted of. And that means your neighbor, your lost neighbor. That means your lost child. That means your lost spouse. That means your lost brother or sister. That means your buddy that you work with each and every day. That's who it's talking about. They need to be convicted of these three things. First of all, the sin of unbelief. There in verse 9. says, of sin because they believe not on me. Unbelief of Christ to the Holy Spirit is a great sin. His mission is to glorify Christ and his first work is is to convict men that rejecting Christ is a sin, a sin against the remedy. Remember what I told you about the caller that called into the radio station? He says, I know what the person needs. He needs Jesus Christ. And the person says, that's not the answer for everything. 
Oh, but it is. You may want to reject it. The world may reject it, but it is the rem remedy for sin. Second there in verse nine, we see, or in verse 10, I'm sorry, of righteousness, of righteousness. They need to be told of righteousness because, why, why? Because I go to my father and ye see me no more. Christ is a coming again, not anytime soon. I mean, he can come back right now, right this second, take his people home. And then he's going to come back later on and set up his millennial kingdom. But that's after the seven years of tribulation, which, you know, you think the hurricane did damage. Wait till he comes back. See what happens. Christ could not go to the father until he had gone to the cross. Christ did not pray on the Mount of Olives in Gethsemane to his father to have the cup removed of going to the cross. He already was appointed to do that before the foundation of the world. He didn't have to pray and say, Father, if this cup be removed from me, but not my will, your will be done. It wasn't about going to the cross. And I don't know where preachers get this. It was already foreordained that Christ was going to come and die on the cross for his people. It wasn't had anything to do with that. So of righteousness to go to the father, he must rise from the dead. And we wouldn't be here today doing what we're doing if he hadn't arisen. He arose for our justification. Romans 4.25 says, Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Now remember what justification is. It's simple to remember if you put just, just if. I'd never sinned. Just if. Vacation. Just if I never sinned. That's what Christ done for us. It's like the slate was white clean. The world needs the imputed righteousness. First Corinthians 1 30 says, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. The Spirit convicts of the need of his righteousness. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Our own righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Before we were saved, that's what God seen. He just seen pure filth. We were children of the devil. He was our father at one point. Do you think, I ask this question, do you think for one minute that you're more powerful than Satan? Let's not worry about God right now. Are you more powerful than Satan? See, he had you in his grips. And you're saying to him and God, by my own free will, I'm going to break that bond. Nah, it ain't happening, folks. Never happened. The only way it can happen is something that's more powerful than Satan. Amen. More powerful than we are. And I've heard people say from time to time, I have the power to accept or reject the gospel. I have the power to accept or reject. Now you can reject the gospel, but I have the power to accept or reject when the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in me. <laughs> How? 
How is that possible? You're talking about having more power than the Holy Spirit. You're having more power than Jesus himself. You have more power than God, the Father, who created all things. Does that even make sense? That's not even logical. But yet, that's what's being preached. Thirdly, verse 11, because of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. See, <clears throat> here's what folks are missing. You may be worshiping Satan, but Satan's going to be judged. So that gives you the, the, the whole scope of the matter. Well, if Satan's going to be judged by God, then who's more powerful? Who's more powerful? As surely as the prince of this world, Satan, has already been judged, so will every unbeliever. We have a few verses of scripture. Let's turn to John chapter 3. Anymore, when you mention John 3, everybody automatically says verse 16, but we're going to skip back and go to verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And we'll just read verse 20. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Why aren't they coming to the light? Because they hate it. They'd rather be in the darkness. So if you'd rather be in the darkness and you hate the light, what happens to when your free will kicks in and says, oh, I'm going to pray the sinner's prayer and let Jesus into my heart. How can you do that when you're already been shackled? Because that's what you are. You're shackled until something has to break them bands. I'm fearful that preachers that preach that today, are <laughs> they're in jeopardy. But God will judge. It's not for me to do that, but he will judge. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14, it says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil who destroyed that. Jesus did. Can you do that? Can you destroy the devil? Even the archangel wouldn't bring accusation against Satan over the body of Moses. But what did he say? The Lord rebuke you. We have no power. But Satan has no power on us. He can sure influence, but he has no power over us once we're saved. So the spirit has come to convict of judgment. Here's your judgment. I'm going to, we're going to convict you of that judgment. And it'll be a fair judgment because God is fair. It'll be precise because God is precise. It'll be perfect judgment because God is perfect. Across the centuries, the Spirit has been prosecuting the world and bringing it into judgment because of its criminal attitude toward the Son of God. Now, understand something. The world hates you because they hated Christ first. That's what the problem is. It's just like today. Why are things happening today? Because... They hate a certain person. They hate them. It doesn't matter what's, what, what's in the cards. 
doesn't matter what can happen. It don't matter. Just, I hate that person so bad. Nothing else matters. Acts chapter 2. You need to read the whole chapter, but I'm just going to read the first part of this. So you, can, uh, you can grasp what, what's happening here. But Acts chapter 2. And just so you know, the church did not start the day of Pentecost because if you read chapter 1, they had a business meeting. The church was assembled together and had a business meeting. So we know the church was already existent. But on chapter 2 there, sorry, verse 1 says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire and it sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, don't hate me for this, but this is one of the places where I really have the criticism. I want to read it as, I didn't read it as it's written here. I want you to pay very close attention. And they were filled with what? It says here the Holy Ghost. All right. Then they turned right around and said, and began to speak with other tongues as the spirit. Oh, wait a minute. Isn't that the ghost? Why isn't the ghost is used there? Why isn't the Holy Ghost used there instead of the spirit? So one of them's wrong. So is it the Holy Spirit? And began to speak with other tongues as the spirit? Or is it the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the ghosts gave them utterance? I'm just saying. Now, you want to prove the point? Go in and look up what ghost, what a ghost is. And then look up what the spirit is. Then try to find, is there a Holy Ghost? Where's the Holy Ghost? What is the Holy Ghost versus the Holy Spirit? This is where it can confuse because we don't believe, as Brother Balmer used to say, we don't believe in ghosts. I don't believe in ghosts. And the ghost definition is far from what the spirit is. If you're going to study the word of God. These things are important. And there's a reason for it. And I won't get into that. But a powerless Christian. Or a powerless church. Will never be successful. In convicting the world of sin. Of righteousness. And of judgment if it's powerless. Where's our power? Where's our power? The power is the Holy Spirit that indwells. See, the Christian has more power than you can. we can even imagine. We don't exercise that power. What did Christ say? He said, if you have the faith of a mustard seed and you can barely see a mustard seed, right? You can tell that mountain to be gone and it'll be gone. You believe that? No. Why? Because you don't have the faith to. If you had the faith, you could do it. We don't have the faith. It's like the woman went to bed. She shut her drape or she, she had her drapes open and she had a perfect view of the mountain. She says, Lord, when I wake up in the morning, I want that mountain to be removed. Shuts the drape, go to bed, get up in the morning, opens up the drape and says, I knew you wouldn't do it. That's the faith we have. You can't deny it. That's why we can't get many things done. A powerless church will not grow. We have to have power. 
We have it. We just don't exercise it. The work must be done by the almighty helper. Not by us, but by the helper. Last point, his mission in the church. What is the helper's mission in the church? To be baptized believer, the spirit has come. If you come forward wanting to be baptized in the church, there's only one prerequisite for that, that you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and he shed his blood for you. Who brought you to that place? The spirit, the helper. As a guide into all truth. Look at verse now, let me get back to my text. John 16, if you forgot where we're at. In verse 13, how be it when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall. Well, who's he hearing this from? See, who's he hearing it from? That shall he speak. There's never been a time when they're not have communication with each other. Will there never be a time? And he will show you things to come. Why? Brother Gordon, I've talked about this a lot. Why do we see it and the other ones don't? Are we magical? Do we have something that is just unbelievable well yeah we can say that it's the spirit of god that's the difference between us and them see we're not and i always say this so you understand we're not better but we are different we are different so he guides into truth because he is the spirit of truth he searches into the deep things of God. 1 Corinthians 2.10, Paul says, But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deeper things of God. And notice Paul didn't say, By his ghost, for the ghost searches all things. If you thirst for the truth, seek the guidance of this heavenly helper. 1 John 2.27 But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. I came to a point in my life where I was going to college. I was working. I was coaching Little League. What else was I doing? I was being a dad, a father, a, a, a husband. I was doing all those things, okay? One of the ladies in the church, said, I told her, I said, I'm going to transfer my uh, credits from Ashland University to Liberty Bible College. And she threw a fit. You're going to be like Jerry Falwell. I said, you've known me for over 20 years and you really believe it. All I want to do is get my degree, period. I didn't care about what they were doing. I just wanted my degree and do it the best way I could. So I had a decision to make. But the church give me a hard time on one hand. I'm overworked on the other hand. What do I do? And you know how many times when, I, when people find out I've, I'm a pastor, well, where'd you go to school? First thing they ask me, where'd you go to school? Well, right here was my answer. Let me read it to you again. I think Brother Ray's the one I brought this to my attention. But, but the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. I'm not saying college isn't important because I learned a lot of things, but I also learned a lot of garbage, a lot of nasty stuff I had to read. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things 
and is truth and is no lie. And even as he hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. I don't need the certificate. I don't need the diploma to do God's work because he called me and he's led me by the spirit to teach me what he wants me to know. Then in verse 14 and 15, he shall glorify me for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. So the helper is a revealer of the things of Christ. He makes known the blessings and the benefits of the death of Christ to us. The world can't understand that. He makes our lives fruitful. John 15, 8. Herein is my father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. As an example of self-abandoned service, Christ sought through self-emptying to glorify the father. Not my will, right? Isn't that what Christ said? Not my will. I came to do the will of my father, not mine. So the spirit seeks to glorify the son. By self-denial, we must honor the son and the spirit. The son did not speak for himself or from himself. John 14, 10 says, Believest thou not that I am in the father and the father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Neither did the spirit, nor should we. Self-will. And self-assertiveness is a usurping of the spirit. If you try to do it on your own, you're usurping the spirit. That's wrong. The spirit should speak through us. And we all know the verse of scripture there, but Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 10, if you want to turn there in closing, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 18 Matthew 10 and verse 18. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in the same hour what ye shall speak. I think I just told that to one of you. Don't worry about it. Why? Because the Spirit's going to lead you. He's going to give you the right word at the right time. And you don't have to worry about it. You need to study. You need to read. That's all. So if he speaks through us, we will speak of things also. May God bless his word to your heart today. Amen.